Um, okay, so um, I sometimes describe myself as a, a fallen or corrupted experimental physicist because I have a background in experimental physics, that's my training, but I have spent the last decade um, teaching and working in a, an art and design context, which means that most of the conversations I have about physics these days are explicitly interdisciplinary. They're in a very hybrid space between many different um, disciplines and ideas. Um, but just a, a quick kind of overview of the things that I have um, in, in my areas of expertise. Um, my undergraduate studies were in philosophy of science. My graduate work was on neutrino physics with the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. My postdoctoral work uh, went to the large extremes of the universe and I studied the cosmic microwave background and the Big Bang. Um, and then more recently, most of the things that I have been doing have been collaborations with artists and uh, musicians. Um, and then along the way, um, a couple of years ago, we invited um, quantum physicist uh, Gabby Limos um, to the Art Institute for um, a semester and uh, she and I began collaborating to do a better job of explaining um, quantum physics ideas to artists, but also responding to themes about quantum physics that were emerging in the arts field at the time. So it was not really um, solely because we were interested in, commun in better clarification, but also because we were witnessing the pressure from the art world um, to start talking about quantum physics in, in new ways. Um, I saw that a chat thing popped up. If, I am ha if I'm speaking too fast or there's a problem, please someone interrupt me. Um, so that is how I ended up thinking um, about uh, quantum physics in an interdisciplinary context. Um, and then I will just note that more recently, I'm, I, my the things I do tend to be kind of all over the place. And right right now what I'm doing is actually mostly working on a farm. <laughs> so um, learning about um, how to do environmental restoration. Um, that's a lot of what I'm doing at the moment. Um, so I'm gonna be drawing from um, a paper that uh, Gabriella and I, um, okay, good, good, good. Uh, wrote um, a couple of years ago called Obliterating Thingness. Um, and this is a picture of Gabby. Um, but I also am going to um, go beyond what's in that paper to comment on um, kind of kind of two two general things. Um, one is that I want to um, oops sorry let's do this. Um, I want to make some comments on the nature of modeling and the way that quantum physics models are employed um, across many disciplines. Um, I've so many times been in uh, rooms or Zoom rooms with people who are talking about quantum models from many different points of view, from physics, from cognitive science, from economics, um, from the social sciences. And I, I notice a lot of times that people don't understand each other or there are some very common pitfalls in those conversations. Um, and one of the key things that I think I can contribute with a physics background is to point out that um, physics does not have any particular authority over quantum anything. Um, so that's one of the things I want to emphasize and I'm going to express that as no unicorns. Um, quantum physics, physics itself doesn't offer anybody, um, especially physicists, any kind of deep claims to reality. Um, but then I want to particularly focus on the idea of quantum entanglement um, because the, the question that has been bothering me for at least a year is really trying to understand if there is something different about quantum entanglement as it is um, explored in a physics lab from claims of quantum entanglement that are um, made in contexts like cognitive science contexts or semantics contexts, um, interdisciplinary contexts. Um, and I would say I'm you know, still personally unsure of the answer to that, but I am in this talk going to try to emphasize that I think that within quantum physics in the physics world, there is something uniquely spooky, um, which is my saying yes to ghosts. Um, so no to unicorns and yes to ghosts is kind of the, the punchline. Um, so again, the context is um, across all the, I, I don't know if everywhere has this metaphor, but in the United States, we have this metaphor of all the different academic disciplines being silos that are separated from one another. Um, clearly, quantum everything has arrived. Um, clearly quantum 
modeling and discussions of quantum ideas um, is very in different ways. Um, examples being um, sweeping philosophical claims. Um, one example of a scholar along those lines would be Karen Barad. Um, mathematical models in lots of other contexts that are drawing from um, new, the ideas about probability that quantum physics um, also draws from that allow for contextuality, interference, nuance. Um, Thomas and others um, in this group certainly work on, on those kinds of things. Um, I, for a while, was involved in conversations with scholar Alexander Wendt, and I, I see him. Um, he's a social scientist in the United States. Um, I see one of his um, interests in quantum physics to be to draw from it for uh, a new type of authority in social theory. Um, I, you know, we might debate this. I, I sort of have some issues with that personally. Um, but then there's also in the humanities and in the arts, a lot of um, exploration of quantum concepts uh, from a more poetic um, or in, you know, creative interpretive stance, um, seeking in those ideas, um, something that is more appropriate to the complexity of human experience than um, I guess classical notions or, or uh, prior notions. Um, but the point is that all of these go well beyond the domain of physics, and it can get um, really confusing when we have all of these discourses um, happening all at once. Um, so I want to try to argue that, uh, specifically, you know, as a physicist, um, my authority as a physicist is pretty limited in this discourse, um, and anyone's authority as a physicist is pretty limited in this discourse. Um, mm -hmm. We have in physics a domain of authority and consensus, which is the observations we make. We have the equation, so observations on the one hand, we have the equations that we develop, the models that we develop on the other hand. And then we have a repeatable set of practices that demonstrates correspondence. Um, this is kind of a simplistic philosophy of science that I'm presenting here, but I'm doing that in order to emphasize that what does, what can physics talk about with, you know, absolute authority, it's what physicists do, which is that we do experiments, we develop models, and then we, we match them. Um, and I want to use the vocabulary that um, the correspondence that we're performing between the models and the experiments is a form of metaphor or analogy. Um, and the reason I want to emphasize that is because quantum physics within physics has an underdetermination problem. Um, maybe it's not a problem actually, but I really want to underscore that to physicists, there is no set quantum ontology. There is no um, consensus or universal interpretation of what any of quantum physics actually means. Um, there are many competing interpretations and there is currently, you know, there's a lot of work on that, but there's currently no, um, no clear path forward that um, has the same level of, of authority as the practices have. Um, so what I mean by that is that when a physicist is using a quantum model, um, an equation, um, the equation up here is, is an example of an expression for a wave function um, for a particle. And the, even within physics, we have a, a serious problem or a serious question that we don't know for sure what the, that thing is. Um, what is the wave function? Um, it's been debated for decades. Uh, we can't answer that. Um, canonical experiments like the double slit experiment, which I have some slides on um, a little later in this talk, um, show us that we have to kind of reject a simplistic story about what happens when we send photons or electrons through an apparatus, which means we don't have a vocabulary for saying what is actually happening. Um, not a single vocabulary. In fact, we have many. Uh, within quantum physics, there are um, there's a huge diversity. This is a, a paragraph extracted from our paper, just showing some of the citations um, across this wide field of quantum interpretations. Um, generally speaking, two physicists who think about quantum physics don't agree on what it means. Um, that's a, a general truth, I think. Um, so I want to underscore this. There's no consensus quantum ontology Physicists, no physicist can stand in front of you and say, this is what it means when we measure all these things in a quantum physics lab, for sure. Um, they can interpret it, but no one has the, the final answer. 
Um, so then I want to make a couple of points about models. And the reason for these points is because I have noticed, um, and I, I, you know, I'm stepping into your conversation after a previous workshop has already taken place and I'm not sure of everyone's uh, backgrounds, but I, I do know that quite often when I'm in an interdisciplinary um, conversation about quantum physics, um, many of the ways that people get stuck actually just have to do with the way that models work, not necessarily with the specifics of a quantum model. Um, and so I want to make the argument that modeling in, in a way is a type of metaphor, and I want to make some specific points that I can then apply to the, the quantum context. So I, pick a different kind of model, something very simple, just a straight line. Um, we use straight line models in physics. A very simple example is you know, free body motion, um, where you know, in the absence of a force, an object will move in a straight line with constant velocity. And so I can define, I can model that with a line on a graph where my axes are position in space or position in time, excuse me. Um, outside of physics, any proportional relationship can also be described with a similar idea or in relation to a similar idea. And that includes things that are more playfully metaphorical and things that are more rigorously modeled. Um, so on the playfully metaphorical, um, give me some more coffee, I need to be more awake. That's a statement of a proportion. Um, more of one thing leads to more of another, which is similar to what's expressed here. Um, but in a very simple economic context, you might have that um, the cost of something goes up as the quantity goes up. So in this really simple example, I wanna point out first of all that both of the, any time that we're expressing a model, it's always a body of mathematics within a broader body of mathematics. Um, that's an important point um, because most of the time, it's not entirely clear exactly which model should be used until you work really hard at it. So it's helpful to know that there is a broader space of models. For example, in this case, variations on linear models or maybe generalized models that have curves would be um, broader models here. Um, then I also want to say that, you know, this, this is to the point that physicists don't have a th like strict authority over quantum models. Um, there's no particular reason to say that either of these applications of the line is more true or than the other, or that one of them is metaphor and the other, other isn't. Um, both of them are basically doing the same thing. And again, analogies and metaphors exist on a spectrum. Um, from things that are more um, sort of fuzzy and, and uh, playful and creative perhaps, or um, maybe not intend conceptual and not necessarily intended to be uh, mathematical to, to what I'm expressing as a type of metaphor that really is a mathematical, um, mathematical pattern uh, and an analogy. Um, there's also in this example, there, there's no particular reason to, to expect that there should be any relationship between straight line motion of an object in space and cost versus quantity relationships. Just because the math matches doesn't mean there's a correspondence. Moreover, just because the math matches doesn't necessarily mean there's any deep meaning to that fact. If we're going to seek the meaning as to why the model works and why the model is interesting, we have to go beyond the model. We have to step beyond the math for that. Um, and a part of, what I mean is that um, if you want to understand what are the real rules behind the system, that is in the context of the disciplinary measurements that you are making. It is not in the model itself. Um, for example, I can show you this model, which has a broken line. Um, it's, it's totally possible for that to work in my simplistic economic example. Um, if the quantity count on a particular thing kicks in but I can't have that happen in physics. And the reason I can't have that happen in physics is not because of the model itself, it's because the context is physics and physics does not allow um, discontinuous jumps in free body motion. Um, so we have to step beyond the model to, to make those kinds of claims. Um, and then I, I really, this is another point that um, all these points are coming up because they're, they relate to pitfalls that I've experienced in interdisciplinary conversations. And you all can tell me, maybe they never happen in this context, but. Um, you can tell me if, if I'm off base. Um, I really wanna emphasize that models are specific and partial. Uh, both of these graphs only make sense in really limited cases. And um, to emphasize the point that I'm trying to make with respect to 
quantum models in particular, um, I will use an, an example that um, I've worked in the past with circuits that involved something called a squid, uh, which is an explicitly quantum piece of circuitry. Um, and when you model a squid circuit, which um, is very simply represented here, um, the model is always hybrid. It's always, you require a quantum model for a piece of it, but you require a classical model for another piece of it. Um, and so in my experience from the world of physics, we never assume that everything is all quantum or everything is all classical or that everything is all anything. Um, generally speaking in a complex system, you need multiple models. Um, you're dealing with multiple scales and contexts and influences. The right set of models is likely to involve many ideas. Um, and so I'm, I'm making that argument to basically say, when we're talking about models, classical versus quantum is, is sort of a false dichotomy. Um, probably you need both in any real context. Okay, um, so I say all these general things thinking about something simple like a line, um, but I say them because I, I think it's useful insights when we're talking about quantum models, um, mathematically defined with things like complex Hilbert spaces, non-commuting observable, ob observables, probabilities calculated with the Born rule. And some of the mathematics um, in non-physics contexts um, like decision theory, economics, linguistics, um, some of the mathematics is the same, but it, the same points that I made before about just a line um, apply here, I would argue. Um, so first of all, uh, it's important to recognize that quantum models in physics are a subset of a whole set of mathematical models, generalized probability models. Um, and it may be that the very specific applications um, that you have in modeling cognition require a different version of a generalized probability model than physics does. Um, and that would make a lot of sense. Um, so it, that general space is important. But my four points here also apply. Uh, the fact that there is a structural similarity between physics and some other realm, quantum physics and some other, in quantum physics and physics and quantum um, behaviors in linguistics, or something um, does not automatically imply that there's a relationship beyond the structural similarity. Um, the same way that there's no particular reason to think that um, cost versus quantity relates to free body motion in space. Um, those, there's no particular reason to seek that. Some people do seek deeper relationships, but there isn't necessarily a reason to. Um, modeling is a type of analogy. Nobody gets to say they're more right or more or less right um, in applying a model. Um, to make sense of a model, uh, we have to go beyond it. We have to interpret it in a context of the rest of physics or the rest of cognition or the rest of semantics, depending on what the context is. And models are specific and partial. So um, just as in physics, even the simplest cases of where we're using quantum technologies, we're always using a hybrid of quantum ideas and classical ideas. I would expect that also um, in evolving models of cognition um, and language. Um, I'm suddenly worried that I've been going too fast and like I'm missing, so somebody interrupt me if there's a problem, please. Um, but I think it's okay. Okay, so, okay, thank you, Thomas. I can, it's so weird talking into the void. I can't, I can't read the room. Um, we all have this problem. So all of these points are to try to, to address, I, I hear these kinds of phrases come up um, in different contexts. Again, maybe not this one, but maybe you have heard things like this. Uh, a physicist might say, social scientists aren't talking about real entanglement, for example. Um, and I just wanna get rid of that idea. Uh, I've also heard people say, the world is really quantum. I've heard people say brains are really quantum, humans are really quantum and not classical. Therefore, we should use quantum models everywhere. Um, and I've heard people say, you know, that really sort of emphasize this, this idea of reality of, of a concept like entanglement, that it's not just metaphor, it really happens. Like entanglement in language is not just a metaphor, it really happens. I want to interrupt all of these thoughts because they all seem to appeal to a type of reality that I don't understand in the concept of, a, in the context of a modeling operation. We don't, we don't know. Um, and I also want to specifically zero in on entanglement 
um, in the second part of this talk um, that it means many things and metaphor also means many things. Um, okay, so that's what I mean by no unicorns. Quantum physics does not deliver miracles, meaning it doesn't deliver reality to physicists or anywhere, anyone else. And I'll summarize that by saying that physici physicists do not own quantum models. We don't own lines either. Um, we have no special authority over any type of model. So if you would like to claim that you're using a quantum model and it's authentically quantum, yes. I mean, if it is, it is. Within physics, there's also no consensus quantum ontology. Um, physicists don't can't say what is really happening to explain how the math works, which takes us to the point that the metaphorical versus real dichotomy is often false, um, especially if we're if what by real we're talking about an, an ontological claim. And then I would also say that in a complex modeling context, quantum versus classical is likely to be false dichotomy too, because you're likely to need multiple models. Um, okay, so no unicorns, but yes, ghosts. Um, and what I mean by that is I, I still think, and I'd like to put forward that they're specifically in the situation of quantum entanglement in physics, there remains something interestingly spooky in the physics context that I have not yet seen convincingly argued to exist outside of physics. And so that's what I wanna kind of put the question um, to for discussion. And I, in the remaining slides, I will be taking something of a philosophical stance on quantum physics because in order to have this this kind of conversation you have to, um, but it's, uh, I guess you'll, you'll see that as it evolves. Um, so there are three related ways that quantum physics strike, I, I don't, I mean, I guess I should be careful about saying it strikes me as weird because actually over time it strikes me as less and less weird. Um, but I think that these are three things that are really important about the way that quanta, little bits of matter and light behave um, that are at, the, at this, the center of why quantum physics is um, philosophically interesting and philosophically rich in physics. Uh, first, non-thingness. This is sort of my own vocabulary for this. Non-thingness is um, a way of expressing that quantum scale entities um, I will use the term quanta, but I mean things like electrons, um, are not things. Um, and let's see, I'll put up the explanations here. Um, where things are entities that have, like my, my water glass that has a definite location, can be sort of separated from the room around it, has well-defined properties. Um, quantum scale behaviors that we observe in the lab also uh, defy narrative descriptions. Um, what is a narrative? I'm going to use that term to mean a well-defined story that can link a cause at one place and time to an effect at another place and time. In a way, it's like the ability to, if not literally, then um, conceptually make a movie of a phenomenon. Um, we can't do that with quantum physics um, explicitly. And finally, um, the spooky part of entanglement is a spooky type of correlations. And I'm using, you know, most of you, I assume, or maybe not most of you, but the term spooky comes into this context from Einstein um, remarking that um, entanglement seems to imply a type of spooky action at a distance. And there's so much debate over how to interpret that, um, but I'm using the term because I'm trying to argue that, that there is something genuinely odd going on with certain types of physics entanglement. Um, and how I would express that is that in certain entanglement situations, there exist statistical correlations between events, dis distant events, distant measurements that appear to violate local causality, that appear to be not explainable on the basis of causal mechanisms as we usually understand them. To elaborate that slightly, um, there is a principle um, in causal analysis called Reichenbach's principle. And you know, it's a principle, so do we know this for sure? Who knows? But that correlations, if we observe correlations, statistical correlations, they should have some kind of a causal explanation. Um, if one statistical stochastic phenomenon is correlated to another, either we have a causal link from one to the other or they have a common cause in the past. There's some, some reason. Um, and in a way, Reichenbach's common cause principle is a, an expression of the drive 
for sense making. It's an expression of the drive that is behind all of science, that if we see a relationship, we want that relationship to make sense. Um, and so, and moreover, in physics, in the space-time context of physics, we also know that causal influences, causality, um, cannot function with influences that exceed the speed of light. Um, so the spooky in the physics context is messing with these ideas, messing with these, um, these ideas and thus violating local causality. Okay, um, time, I think I'm okay. Um, just to restate and elaborate slightly on some of those points, um, this is an illustration of the classic double slit experiment. Um, and I'll talk about it with electrons, but it could be photons or atoms. So you start with an electron source. Um, you send the electrons through a barrier that has two slits. You detect the electrons on a detector screen. And when you just do it with one electron, it lands someplace. Um, you get a mark on your screen. When you accumulate many electrons, you get something called an interference pattern which is an imprint of both slits that has somehow built up with each individual electron interacting with the apparatus. Um, it's really hard to talk about this. And in, in that's kind of my point is that in physics, um, we have this result and we have the math behind it. But the second I try to verbalize it in words, it gets like super messy um, in terms of trying to express what is going on here. Um, Whatever is going on here, it's not something that is easily drawn or described in language in thing-like and narrative terms. Um, the single electron cannot be described as having a well-defined position or path through space in order to explain how it, this pattern builds up. We also cannot recon reconstruct a story. We cannot take a movie of this and see why it ends up the way that it does. Um, partly because there is an intrinsic or, or an apparently intrinsic randomness to what's going on here, but partly because of contextuality and the fact that what occurs in the situation depends on what we do. So the very act of, of trying to take a movie or trying to understand what goes on in the situation will change it. Um, so those are sort of some illustrations of, of what I mean by non-thinkness and non-narrative behavior in quantum physics specifically. And then the spooky entanglement, um, I'm gonna try to say what entanglement is without using the usual vocabulary that physicists use when they try to explain entanglement. And it's probably gonna be very confusing, but that's kind of the point. Um, the spooky kind of entanglement in physics results when we take a system, um, the black box up here, who knows what it is, we prepare two subsystems and send each subsystem to different locations very far away from each other and do measurements on two subsystems. We find in certain contexts that there are correlations between spatially separated, me separated measurements with the quantum property of contextuality and with the inability of any signaling from one to the other. And this is uniquely spooky because of the violation of local causality. So let me elaborate some of these terms so that it, um, hopefully they'll make a little more sense. Local causality is a, con a concept in physics that relates to the space-time structure of physics. And the idea is that, um, and it's a sensible idea, but quantum physics calls it into question. The idea that an event cannot be statistically influenced by any events outside its past light cone. Past light cone is a way of referring to any event in the past from which information could have come to this moment in this event in this in the present. No signaling means that the choice of measurement settings on one side does not impact probabilities measured on the other. And that um, is demonstrated and it's it's also embedded in the um, in the formalism in this case. Contextuality means that measurement um, properties depend on the context and specifically on the other measurements that are being made. Okay, so this is a, like real, like a lot of technical terms to express um, what I mean by the spooky entanglement, but I'm kind of doing that on purpose because the, the point that I want to make is that there is a type of entanglement 
that makes physicists freak out, like freak out and be like, wait, what is going on in the world? Why, why is it working this way? And we freak out about causality and we freak out about space and we freak out about time and like, what, how is this possible? But the issue is technical and it's specific to the physics context. Like it's specific to, we're talking about causality in space and time um, and no signaling. Um, and I will also point out that I am making my philosophical commitments clear in some of these statements. Um, not all physicists agree that there's anything spooky at all um, in this type of entanglement, but I, I think that there is. And so really what I'm trying to argue is that there is a type of spooky entanglement and it has to do with the physics context. It has to do with the space-time situatedness of correlations that violate local causality. And that is a subset of a more generalized idea of entanglement that is more um, directly associated with ideas about non-separability, contextuality. And I would locate that there are examples in physics, such as classical entanglement that are in this larger bubble, but not in the smaller bubble. But I also think that the beyond physics con concepts of entanglement um, probably entirely inhabit the outer bubble. And I think that's the question I want to pose um, in, in this conversation. The point is, we can be using the same math, we can be using the same definition of entanglement in any context and be equally right, equal, equally rigorous, equally authentic. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're equally spooky because the spooky in this case of physics is not in the math, it's in the physics. So um, just to sum up then, uh, I tried to make some general points about models because I want to undermine the idea that physicists have all this authority that they often claim to say that no one else can talk quantum anything but also to undermine some of the attempts people make to attribute enormous amounts of significance to the fact that a model works. So quantum physics and those models does not deliver miracles to anybody. Um, but I want to make the argument subject to discussion that I think something spooky happens in physics, um, specifically with entanglement that does not happen anywhere else. Okay.